something that you can't do now that you used to be able to do. Skiing, swimming, running, going on the bike. You so you'd expect to get back on the ski slopes, would you? Absolutely. You've got the right stuff, the right attitude. You can pretty much carry on with everything as, as good as before. Nothing stopping you. And it isn't only wounded soldiers that are benefiting from this new technology. From head to toe, biomechanics is finding ways to repair and replace nature's finely tuned machine. The ambition for biomechanics is for prosthetics to be truly integrated. And for that, they would need to be controlled by the user's mind. But until recently, interfering with the workings of the brain just wasn't an option. Today, that's all starting to change. The ability to delve into and manipulate the brain has many potential benefits, not only for the control of prosthetic limbs. Diane Heyer suffered from depression for more than 20 years. Her illness was so crippling that it even drove her to attempt suicide three times. So tell me what it's like to be depressed. It's awful. It's like being in a dark cave. Nobody around, cold, lonely. If you have depression, you have absolutely no desire to live. And it just is like that day after day after day. Uh, and actually, I guess I felt dead inside. Uh, you know, I was like a living, talking, dead person. I tried several medications, and I also tried ECT, electroconvulsive yeah. therapy. That was pretty awful, too. In a last-ditch attempt to control her depression, Diane underwent groundbreaking surgery in the hope of controlling her devastating depression. In a five-hour operation, electrodes were directly inserted eight centimeters into her brain. To check that the electrodes were in the correct position, Diane was woken up during the procedure so that the impulses could be adjusted. You know, when I woke up, they said, you know, we're gonna turn this on now and you let us know how things are feeling. And at first I felt pretty warm and then they turned it to another setting and my heart was galloping. How are you feeling? Starting to smile, feel happy. And then all of a sudden I just got this great big grin on my face. Right. And uh, after that, then they put me back to sleep yeah. so they could finish up the surgery. So you sort of immediately felt, you felt happy, did you suddenly? Oh yes, yes. For me, it was instantaneous. What, did it, what was that like? Uh, amazing. Um, it was almost like my brain was doing gymnastics. You know, it's, it's how I used to feel when I would go to work and, and, you know, have good weekends and do things. And... Three years later, and Diane lives with the system wired into her own body, much like a pacemaker. And um, where do the wires run? Because they're the yeah. control box is in your chest, isn't it? Right, yes. They um, start here and then they go down to the back of my skull and down the back of my neck and around and then uh, plug into a battery pack on my chest. Does it worry you that you had a totally experimental thing inside your brain? No. No, because it's been worth it. From the very moment the electrodes were switched on, Diane's depression disappeared. And of course your life has changed totally. Well, 180 degrees. Yeah. I wake up every day and I think, what's today gonna bring? I have an excitement about living again that I did never have. So you're the perfect bionic woman. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Even as a last resort, it seems utterly terrifying to think of thrusting an electronic device deep into the center of the brain in the way that's happened with Diane. But you can't knock it because it's completely changed her life. Because of its power to transform lives and potential to touch many others, Bionics definitely has a place in my top 10. Is it the most significant advance in the last 50 years? That's up to you to decide at the end of the program. Or maybe you'll go for my next choice, a remarkable invention that
that more than any other, perhaps, has caused change. It's changed the way I work. It's changed the way I find out about New York. Keep track of what my kids are doing. Compare prizes. Look up football scores. Talk to friends. Shut up again. Raise money for charity. Watch the news. It's changed the way I do my research. In fact, it's changed our lives in a thousand ways. I, for one, couldn't do without it. It is, of course, the World Wide Web. It's astonishing to think that the majority of us went online for the very first time just 10 years ago. My first contact with the internet was one day when I went into the lab and saw my Chinese PhD student typing on the screen and there she was typing and then suddenly she took her hands off the keyboard and some other letters appeared just underneath. What was happening of course was that she was communicating with somebody in Hong Kong. I thought this will never take off. The World Wide Web required all the computers in the world to be able to talk to each other using one common language. But that was impossible until 1990 when a British scientist called Tim Berners-Lee figured out a way to link everybody up. Welcome to my world. He created a code allowing computers to share information. And suddenly, we could speak to each other. Welcome to my world. And a new age of communications began. Because the web was never patented, it is free and open to anyone to use. Today, 1.7 billion people use the web globally. Hi everyone, today we're going to be doing a Hollywood lip look. When you're poaching eggs without an egg poacher, it can get a little bit messy. So if you can dance like this? Not since the invention of the printing press have we seen such a leap forward in the amount of information freely available to everyone. And never before has there been such a platform for ordinary people to make their voices heard. This is just my opinion. You disagree? Feel free. It's how we communicate with friends. One billion of us use social networking sites and 300 million meet people in a virtual world. Our children use it to interact, to learn and play. It's transformed news and information. In business, we've all become traders, buying and selling at the click of a button. For all of the risk of exposure to violence and pornography, worrying issues we have to face, the internet is one of the most significant advances of the past 50 years. And for me, the web is exciting because it allows all of us to participate in science like never before. Dr. Chris Lintott has the task of classifying over a million galaxies from photos taken by robotic telescopes. He was so overwhelmed by the amount of data that he enlisted thousands of online volunteers to help him. But the really exciting thing is that these armchair scientists made a new discovery. A couple of years ago, a group of our volunteers noticed that in the background of some of the images, there were these small, round, green objects. They called them peas, and they found a couple of hundred of them and came to us and said, well, what are these? And so we've looked at these with some of the world's largest telescopes, and they turn out to be galaxies undergoing a dramatic burst of star formation. These are the most efficient makers of stars anywhere in the local universe. And they've been missed by professional astronomers. It was only thanks to the help of a quarter of a million people, their armchairs and their internet connections, that they came to our attention. Galaxy Zoo is just one of a host of projects inviting the public to get involved in science. Who knows what progress we could make through collaborations like these made possible by the internet. This massive progress in how humans exchange information undoubtedly makes it one of the defining advances in the last 50 years. Does the far-reaching impact of the World Wide Web on all our lives make it the most significant advance? Or does the revolutionary joining of man with machine mean that biomechanics gets your vote?
could it be the promise of clean energy for us all that makes the laser your number one? Before you decide, there are four more advances to consider. The next one has the potential to change everything we've ever believed in. distinguishes us from all other creatures it's human inquisitiveness why are we here where we're going what's our place in the universe looking down on the world from above you realize just how insignificant we are since the dawn of time people have marveled at all the vastness around us and wondered how did it all begin In the 1920s, American astronomer Edwin Hubble showed that the universe was expanding. And from this simple observation, it was calculated that if you run the clock back, everything must have exploded into existence nearly 14 billion years ago in a big bang. For me, I suppose what I find so exciting about big bang is the ambition of the idea. Here is an idea which is not just about our planet or about our solar system, but unifies our whole notion of the universe. And it tells us about our beginnings, about where we came from, and possibly to where we're going. But the Big Bang Theory also predicted that the entire universe, all the planets and galaxies we see around us exploded from nothing, which sounds crazy. When it was first proposed almost 100 years ago, the idea was controversial. But in the last 50 years, science has started to gather hard evidence that the Big Bang may not be such a crazy idea after all. In 1965, two radio astronomers working on this satellite antenna in New Jersey started to pick up a strange signal radiation was coming from somewhere in really deep cosmic space beyond any radio sources that any of us knew about or even dreamed existed. The daring explanation for the radiation was that it might be the last remnant of the Big Bang echoing through space and time. Perhaps. In 2001, the WMAP spacecraft analyzed this radiation and even produced a map of the early universe that seemed more or less to prove the Big Bang Theory. But unfortunately, as yet, it doesn't explain why the Big Bang banged in the first place. High in the Californian hills, at the Lick Observatory, astronomers are trying to calculate how fast the universe is expanding in the hope that they'll be able to shed some light on the problem. And in doing so, they've made a surprising discovery. Everyone anticipated that gravity would slow down the expansion of the universe. So we were trying to measure how much the universe has been slowing down in order to predict whether it'll expand forever, though more and more slowly, or recollapse. Instead, we found that it's actually speeding up, not slowing down at all an accelerating universe. How does that work? Why should it do that, do you think? Well, we think the universe is filled with some weird substance. We call it dark energy, but we know essentially nothing about it. So it's there, and it's, in a sense, gravitationally repulsive, causing space to expand faster and faster with time. It's all very well to say that the universe is expanding, but one of the questions that I think will puzzle a lot of people, including me, is what are we expanding into? Well, that actually puzzles all of us we may be expanding into a bigger hyperspace, one with more dimensions. And there could be all sorts of universes expanding within this bigger space. And ours is just one of these universes in the multiverse. Now, I, I accept that what you're doing is incredibly interesting, but it's useless, isn't it? Well, in a sense, it's useless, but the accelerating nature of the universe is important in part because it may help us understand the Big Bang. So it's the birth of the universe. And so we should try to understand 
how it is that it happened, and how the universe has evolved since then. Mm -hmm. But the